the Joe Rogan experience. So let's talk about what we were just talking about. You yeah. were you wrote a book with a guy about drug dealing, and he was going to come on wearing a mask. Yeah, he wanted to come on wearing a, a Barack o Obama mask, actually. <laughs> uh, it's, it's actually really funny. The whole story is really funny. I'm writing this book. Um, oh, I spilled it, too. Um, it's called The Business Secrets of Drug Dealing. Uh, you can find it at businesssecretsofdrugdealing.com, um, and I'm serializing it. Uh, but basically, uh, somebody I knew for ages um, in a completely different capacity uh, sort of came out to me last year and said, um, you know, I've been a high-level drug dealer for, for a long time, basically my whole life. And wanted to tell his story about, uh, you know, sort of the, the whole progression of his life. What kind of drugs? Uh, only things that grow out of the ground. Okay. So uh, he started off, um, this, is a, this is an African-American guy. Uh, he started off, believe it or not, selling mushrooms. Uh, he, he sort of grew up half in the projects and half in, in an upscale suburb. Uh, and he, in the upscale suburb, he sold mushrooms, which he um, uh, basically got through mail order at a time early in the sort of history of the internet when there were some loopholes about things. You could get spores, right? Yeah. Well, actually, you could get the actual. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, so he ends up having this whole career. Uh, uh, and he wanted to sort of explain to me what the rules of the game were uh, and do sort of a book version of the Ten Crack Commandments. Uh, <laughs> and so we sat down, and um, we couldn't quite figure out how to do it at first, but we ended up essentially doing a sort of fictionalized version of, uh, of his life. Um, and... The progression is amazing because he he goes from being uh, a dealer in all these different parts of the country in different social spheres. He's uh, in college. He deals to rich white kids. He deals on the street and in in you know tough urban neighborhoods, and then ends up sort of in the legal business uh, in, in this state. Uh, and As a lawyer? No, 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 no. He legal marijuana. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. Uh, and so he's describing that world, which is not. Um, there are a lot of misconceptions about it. Uh, there, are, there are some things about it that are um, not known terribly well. Like, you know, what do you do when you work, uh, you know, at a, at a farm and uh, your crop tests dirty? You know, with a with a contaminant. Um, well, you know, not everybody just throws it away. You know, a lot of that stuff ends up shipped across country, goes to other markets, uh, and he sort of describes a lot of, of this. Like, what kind of contaminants would that be? Like fungal or yeah, pesticides? like a like a like a fungus, mm. uh, something like that. Uh, you know, there are labs that basically have to clear. Uh, you know, from what I understand, um, that have to clear each of the crops. And uh, and there are situations where you know there's a whole bunch of crop and you got workers that have to be paid and what do you do with it? And the the legal market isn't big enough um, to accommodate all the stuff that's grown, and so there's sort of still you know kind of a black market that goes on. And he 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 describes this. And uh, but it, even before that, it's just a fascinating book about. You know all the different things that he learned uh, in the course of his career about how to get a you know um, do the job and not get caught, how to how to rig a load uh, to drive cross country, how do you do a dummy car? Um, you know he, he tells a story about how basically you want four cars, you want the guy in the front seat to be to be to look like a drug dealer, have a terrible record, drive badly. Uh, basically, to attract the police, uh, <laughs> and the you know the third car is the load car. The second car is sort of watching to see if there's there's cops in either direction, and then the fourth car is basically driving up uh, behind the load car to sort of prevent anybody from seeing the license plate and that sort of thing. And so Whoa. he just talks about all this stuff, and it's 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 fascinating. And um, it was a new kind of writing for me because. 
I've never really done anything except straight journalism, and we sort of had to do it in narrative form. And so we're, we're putting it out serially online right now, which is really cool. So you did one of those, ch- change the names to protect the innocent? Sort exactly. Of yeah, yeah. But, or, or the guilty. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but m- for the most part, based on facts. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. The situations were, let's just say, realistic, you know. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and his, you know, the observations were that uh, that he describes are all, you know, things that he actually learned. The situations were, you know, relatively close to things that actually happened. So, yeah. That's interesting. So that's available now? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep. Again, it's... Uh, uh, business secrets of drug dealing dot com. It's it's a kind of a new thing. I I I, I grew up um, a huge fan of uh, serialized uh, detective stories. I was a big fan of like Dashiell Hammett and Raymond Chandler, and I loved uh, Black Mask Magazine, which was the big pulp noir magazine in the twenties and thirties. And um, you know, I grew up reading all those stories, and I always. It was in the back of my mind always that I wanted to try this uh, and write a book uh, on a deadline. So I'm doing this now. It's it's, a, it's basically co-written with this uh, anonymous character who can't appear with me on shows like this uh, anywhere because he has he's he's still not captured and. Um, so is there, are there warrants out for this guy? No, he's never been picked up. Uh, never been arrested. Never been arrested. No. Nope. Whoa. Yeah. Uh, Sounds like a smart dude. He is a smart dude. He is a smart dude, and some of his employers would be very surprised to know that he's got uh, a hobby like this. Um, <laughs> uh, it's funny, you know. I knew him again. I knew him for years and didn't have the faintest clue uh, that that this was this was going on. So, did he keep a job in order to avoid suspicion? So. Uh, the the book is actually structured with all these rules. Each chapter has has rules in it. One of his his most important rules is always have a job, uh, and he, it's for a number of reasons. Number one, um, it, he talks about how when he was young, he worked at, at places like you know Marriott or Applebee's, and he's like, you know, if you can serve. Um, have the patience to serve people at an Applebee's and not blow up and scream at people, then you won't screw up a package. Like, <laughs> in other words, if if you can have the self discipline to actually get through one of these jobs and not blow up and be crazy, then you're going to handle handle yourself well at a car stop. That's fascinating. So he used it almost like as a discipline exercise. He used it as a discipline exercise. He learned, among other things, like. Uh, another one of his rules is dress like an off-duty's Applebee's waiter, right? <laughs> like, do not dress. Uh, and, he, and he talks about this about how most dealers um, they learn their their uh, profession uh, by watching movies. You know, there's no there's no book out there. I mean, there, it's not like this generation is growing up reading like the old Iceberg Slim or Donald Goins novels or whatever it is. They're watching, you know, The Wire or Blow or, or Ozark now or whatever right. it is. Um, but dealers very often dress like dealers. You can you can kind of spot them, you know. And he says that's exactly the opposite of what you have to do. Um, you know, wear Sperry shoes, wear boring clothes, look like, you know, you've, you're on your way to, to, you know, your freshman English class or whatever it is. Um, and, you know, sound like a nerdy college kid when, when, uh, the cops pull you over and all this stuff is, uh, is sort of central to his, his whole, uh, worldview about how to avoid getting caught. Wow, that would be a great book. It, it, I mean, it is. It's 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 really fun, and you know the the fact that um, that the you know the co-author is actually a person who's pulling this off makes it makes it really interesting, and it makes it a, a, a real challenge to write it too because um, you know I had to kind of uh, simulate his voice uh, and kind of communicate to people what what those situations were like and what things look like from his point of view and obviously I'm white and he's African American and that's that's tough and uh, but you know it, I think it works it, it's kind of a cool story but it must have been a juicy like when you found the subject you must have been like oh boy we got something here 
Like, oh that yeah, seems, like, super juicy. Yeah, no, it's 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 so much fun. I haven't had this much fun, like fun fun writing anything for <laughs> for a long time because, um, you know, most most criminal memoirs. And again, I grew up a junkie in terms of reading this stuff. I love. I love books uh, that are written after the fact by people who were in crime. You know, like Papillon was one of my favorite books growing up. I mean, it's a it's an amazing story about not not just crime but about prison and what's that like. But they're always written by people after they got caught, right? And so there's never that book by the person who's still out there uh, and and talking about what outlaw life is like. Um, successfully uh, still on the other side of the law and that that part of it is fascinating it's just uh, it's a completely new thing and and he has all these insights that I that I would never have thought about like he, he talks about how um, there's a thing he calls the hood price like if you when you're dealing uh, uh, selling to um, uh, in black neighborhoods even he charges a higher price uh, because there's more. There are more problems that you inevitably run into when you're dealing in those neighborhoods because there's more cops, which means more lawyers, which means more security, which means more attention to detail. When you deal to rich white kids, there's just nobody's paying attention, so you just <laughs> there's less overhead, you know, in the business, uh, wow. which is which is fascinating. It's it's uh, and you know he talks all about this and and he ha- he has. He spent a lifetime kind of just keeping all this stuff in his head, always wanting to, to put it down, and he just it got to be too much, and he just sort of tapped me on the shoulder one day and said, can we have lunch? I just want to talk to you about something. <laughs> <laughs> and how is, long had you known him before this? I would say three years. Wow. Three years, four years. Yeah. yeah That's like crazy. That. Yeah, it was wow, very Wow, cool. we had to trust you. Well, I'm glad we decided to not have him on because he would get busted. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That I, would be I, how I, I he would get busted. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, like you can't – like if you were on something and you had a mask on, people would go, that's Matt Taib. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, right, right. There would be somebody listening to him. He d- Maybe he doesn't understand that there's millions of people listening. I, I totally agree with you. Hundreds of those people would go, that's whatever. Right. That's Mike. That's John, whatever his name is. They would get it. Even the even the Unabomber got caught and he only talked to like two people. <laughs>